I'm and sure when, sorry, 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 I have my gun. I'm sure. Go ahead. I'm sure Thunder um, Gordon's wanted to say something, but if not, we'll go back to David. I'll, I'll go real quick. Um, it, it's what I said to uh, that creationist guy I went to see his talk uh, a couple months ago uh, in the Q&A section, uh, Brad Harrop. Uh, the, well, the first question I had for him is, you know, science has been so productive. When it was freed from religious dogma, and science was free to ask those really ruthless questions and pursue them based on the evidence, we, we got most of the things that we have today. Whereas when we constrain our science to just that which is compliant with religious doctrine, you get nothing. You get the dark ages. You get a complete stagnation of science because things like evolution help to make sense of things. Uh, and not teaching students to understand the underlying principle is a formula for failure. It's a formula for a new dark age. Uh, yeah, and they're completely to open to that. I mean, it, it, it's amazing to me the, the similarities between the original dark ages and what they want for the modern theocracy, as I was explaining in Tallahassee. All, all I did in the Tallahassee speech was read from the Republican Party platform. It was medieval. I mean, look, look, I, I think uh, if you st take a couple of steps back, the problem becomes even uh, clearer. You know, why do we actually educate children at all? What's the point of it, right? And the whole point of it is, is that we've had um, millions of man hours of really smart people analyzing problems in order to um, collate data. And what allows us to whatever... Um, sequence genomes, build computers and the such like, is our ability to store access and teach that information to the next generation, right? You, you are by, why you have schools is such that you can, you know, do that matrix thing where you basically upload the knowledge of all of the smartest people working on a lot of the problems um, that you know, mankind has an interest in solving, and you can do it in, you know, whatever, 20 years or something. Um, why would you, if, if you really just want to say, here is some information, go make up your mind, why bother with schools at all? Why not just actually send the kids out and say, make up your own mind about the world? You know, the, the reason that you do this is such that you don't have to, from first principles, understand to, to work out Newtonian physics on your own from first principles. You don't have to do it because we can teach it in schools. That's why we do it. I mean, to, to me, the, the idea that um, you throw away all of this hard-earned information and just sort of tell the kids to make up their minds and believe whatever they want... It, uh, it, it really just undermines the entire principle of education. The former uh, president of the Board of Education in Texas once said that, that students should be allowed to jump to their own conclusions. <laughs> he actually said that. Yeah, he also said that uh, this, um, this critical thinking stuff is gobbledygook. Is this the dentist Don McLeary? No, yes. it's it not. Yes, it was Don. No, it was oh. that wasn't Don McLeary. That was Bradley. Uh, that guy. This is the, this is a guy who was uh, the, the vice chairman of the board of education, and he has no education to speak of. I mean, I, I believe a high school diploma. That's it. And he homes. He, he was homeschooled himself and homeschools his own kids. So why was he ever on the state board? But I'm going to leave that alone. Um, I said we'd go straight back to David, but I think we're going to go back to David via concordance. He wants to tell us about that wonderful quote. Which one? Standing on the shoulders. Oh, uh, World 2. I can't remember the, the exact wording, but uh, you know, here at Aperture Science, we don't stand on the shoulders of giant's crap. We, we do the science fresh each time, mm. so they don't, they don't mess around with pre previous work. Yeah, exactly. David, let's go back to you. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to, to put in there that um, I'm doing a, or I have done a degree in ancient history, and I'm at the moment studying uh, for a master's in ancient history at Bristol. Um, and the reason I like the, the, that period of history is precisely what we were discussing. You know, as soon as you leave um, you know, ancient history and you start going into pre-modern history and medieval period, it's just, it's like, 
the Romans left, and then the people that were left had a choice. We can either go and live in mud huts, or we can live in these villas. And we're going to choose the mud huts and go down the route of, you know, the religious dark ages, which is so disappointing. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my final point, um, or thing that I wanted to bring up was, um, I don't know how many people are aware of it, but um, in England recently there's been a uh, sort of a law passed which um, which mandates that schools that receive funding from the government have to, by law, teach evolution as scientific fact, essentially. Um, and they're not allowed to get around this because they were planning on getting around it by not teaching evolution in science classes, teaching creationism in religious classes, and then the only thing that the kids are being exposed to is creationism in religious classes. Um, so what they've done is they've said, no, you can't only subject them to one point of view, even if it's in a religious classroom, which is allowed, you have to teach them evolution in science classrooms. Um, so, I mean, I wonder why why this sort of thing wasn't being adopted in the US. Why, why is that such an impossibility? Because as I mentioned before, in the United States with the creationism movement, they don't care what the truth is. Truth is irrelevant. The whole perspective is, is they have, it's a matter of pretend. They have an imaginary world that they have built up, and they've got an imaginary history that they've rewritten. I mean, if, check out the movie The Revisionaries. They want to rewrite history so that it leads up to them as the ultimate conclusion. And they don't, they really don't care what the facts are. They're not out to understand anything. You've got people that want to understand, who have a natural curiosity, and then you have people who don't. And Texas, I'm sorry, is is uh, heavily populated with people who don't want to understand. They have instead a deep-seated need to believe. And that's why we have so many megachurches. When I went to the administrator to say something about how this man was saying uh, God created dinosaurs instantly, right? Is she said, well, I mean, you have what you believe and they have what they what they believe. And, you know, there is just a not understanding of science. I mean, if I'd rather, rather not, I'd rather not believe algebra is that hard as it is. But it is, you know. I mean, I, 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 I think concordance basically had it right there with, you know, what I believe built great civilizations. Uh, what you believed has achieved nothing. Uh, you know, this, there, there is an objective parameter that you can distinguish these two on. Yes, and, and less than achieving nothing, Thunderfoot. I mean, it's important that people be begin to see, and I would like for them to see, how much religion has historically always been an impediment to progress, not just in science, but in politics and human rights and practically every other avenue as well. It's just like Hitchens said, religion poisons everything. It's easier to believe, and it takes a lot of thought to understand evolution. And you're not going to put the effort into doing it if you want to have that feel-good feeling that God created you in his own image and you're super special, you know? And you're the reason that the universe exists. And what's and I, and I like concordance. They wrote, was it you, concordance, that said, what is the purpose of heaven? No, it was me. It, well, it was you. It was you. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, and I, I very much like that because there is no purpose to heaven. I mean, it's to spend an eternity, you know, filleting this tyrant, and that's that's well, that it. That's, yeah, it's completely yeah. pointless. It's redundant. It's exactly the same as on Earth. You know, you can superimpose whatever purpose you want onto heaven. You know, you can fly, run around all day chasing butterflies with a butterfly net, or singing hymns to your God. But you can do that on Earth. And anything you can do in heaven, you can do on Earth. You can sing to God all you like on Earth. You just have a, you know, a death date. And um, so the ultimate question, or the, 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 the ultimate judgment there, whether you go to heaven or hell, and both of them are being eternal, and there's no way to change anything. There's no decisions that can be made there. There's no way to be in heaven and piss off God and go to hell, and there's no way that God will be merciful of people. You know what? You've been in hell long enough. Come on up. There's no changing this. So what you've got is people offering unimaginable rewards that they will never have to produce, and that's only for those who believe the nonsense they're selling. And if you don't believe the nonsense they're selling, well, then they don't just have a carrot. They have a stick, too. And that's where you got the eternal damnation, the fate worse than death, which, again, they'll never have to produce. And the fact is that choice is so childish in itself and so unrealistic on its face that that one 
option, given the choice of heaven or hell, just the presentation of those options should already be evidence enough to tell you that there's no there there, that there's no substance to this belief system. Because it wouldn't be this choice if God were real. I think um, quite a few people uh, on the panel are actually uh, contributors to a video done by Seth Andrews, who's the moving force behind the Thinking Atheist channel. Uh, when he um, did a video about heaven and the afterlife, and it was undoubtedly the case. I mean, I, I contributed. I know that you did. Oh, and I'm not That's Thunderfoot. You did as well. I think concordance. I'm not so sure about, but our, our collective main point, I think, was that the idea of an eternity of any sort, even in heaven, would actually be hell for us. And I think I expressed it that way myself. And the reason is that I do. I, I can't see that eternal life is a blessing. I think it's actually a torment. Um, so for me, eternal life, yeah, I think, I, again, I put it somewhere, the first thousand years might be bearable, the first ten thousand, uh, no, the first million, no, and that's just the beginning. The, I, it's an odd thing to say, but there, uh, for me, there's a time to hang up the party, walk away from the party, uh, <laughs> hang up your codpiece. Yeah, I've seen that video of you walking home, it seems that, yeah, that's quite early in the morning, that video on Facebook. I have no idea what you're referring to. I, 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 I plead my rights under the Fifth Amendment. But no, the idea of heaven, even if it is, uh, if we can perceive it in this lovely way, still, I think, would be a hell. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was very happy to be involved in that particular video. Uh, and it's too bad that Concordance wasn't a part of that. But, I mean, DPR Jones and Thunderfoot both did brilliantly in that. Um, and it was a, it was a very good collaborative effort. It's one of the best things that we've all done together. Um, I mean, if you want me to wrap up, um, since it's quite festive, the uh, the miracle on Thirty Fourth Street is being aired, um, and there's a, a brilliant scene in that where um, it's uh, for anyone who doesn't know, it's about Santa Claus essentially going under undergoing a legal trial to see whether or not he exists, um, and. Uh, the guy, the lawyer, comes up to the table and says, uh, which is worse, a lie that draws a smile or a truth that draws a tear? And of course, the, the answer is, um, in, in the context of the film, that it's better that these children believe in Santa, even if he doesn't exist, um, than to, you know... Than know I have many and, times... And I disagree. People, I've My heard parents, many times people what? use the defense that if God did not exist, it would be necessary to create him. And they're using the same logic that you're highlighting right now. Yeah, and it, and it goes back to what I was saying, where I don't think these people actually do believe. It. I think a lot of them do, but I mean, there are some who pretend, and they know they're pretending. And I think it's a very conscious thing. I have encountered people who, when I shake their beliefs, actually do hold their hands over their eye, over their ears, close their eyes, run out of the room, whatever, to escape the reality that I'm imposing on them. They have a desperate need to hold to that belief. I was in a debate with this one guy who told me that he was completely objective. He was a, he was a Methodist, and he, was, and he understood science, and he was completely accepting of all things science, and he would be completely objective if I could give him evidence that there was no God. And it wasn't minutes later before he confessed that he would rather take a bullet in the ear than to give up his faith. And I simply brought forward, well, then you're not being objective, then are you? It, you, it matters more that you believe than you even live. It's more important to you than life itself. And a lot of people have told me that very sentiment. They need to believe and damn anything else. Their belief matters more to them than their families. And they'll come out and say that too. They'll ostracize their own children. They'll, they'll abandon their, their coworkers, their spouses, whatever. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. They will maintain that delusion. At all costs. Well, that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the miracle of Thirty Fourth Street. Um, I like it quite well. So, I mean, for anyone that hasn't watched that film, I recommend it and pay close attention to that scene um, because it, it ultimately all ends in uh, in the, the judge saying that well, if God can exist and is printed on our money, then Santa Claus can exist as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. So, I mean, you can get some of the callers on. Thank you very much indeed for your call, David. No problem, guys. Thanks for having me on. And have a, have a wonderful Christmas, if I'm allowed to say that. Bye. Bye. You said Christmas. <laughs> Are, aren't we at war with Christmas? <laughs> well, 
I, I, I said it me? deliberately well, look. because what has happened in the last week, I've already seen the videos appearing on YouTube in which Bill O'Reilly is and, and Fox News in general is being criticised for uh, their reporting of this war on Christmas. And what I have found is that this is something I'm only aware of since I joined YouTube, which was about six years ago. Every single year at about this time of year, we get exactly the same thing. Fox News saying, oh, these evil, nasty atheists are no, declaring no, DPR, their war on DPR, Christmas because they're taking a court action against this or that. They never once accurately report the fact that, it, that it's someone trying to defend the Constitution. No, you don't get that. It's the evil atheists. I've heard it for six years. I'm bored with it. You've had it, Aaron, obviously for substantially and longer, DPR, being, living in America. That's what I'm pissed off about. It bores me senseless. Merry Christmas, everyone. I don't care what you say. DPR, Sorry, you've, got it, you've got it all wrong. Um, what, what the war on Christmas is, is it's people trying to turn the capitalistic festival of Christmas into some sort of religious festival. That's the war on Christmas. And they're using political avenues to do it, which is why we have to defend the Constitution. And DPR is right. We're never going to get credit for defending the Constitution, nor in the fact that the atheists are leading the, the defense of the freedom of religion, which, of course, you can't have if you have uh, a state. Aaron, I think, you, I think you missed it as well. Christmas is not and hasn't been a Christian festival for years. It's a capitalist festival. Well, right? that's what I'm saying. It's only the Christmas. crazies who want to try and turn Christmas into a religious. No, we, we're not missing hey. the point, Thunder. We get that point. We're being right, sarcastic. Well, well, hold on. Let me let me clarify something. I mean, I mean, this year, uh, we're we're taking a family holiday to celebrate Chinese New Year. Okay. I mean, I will celebrate any number of holidays that that. I find amusing or that I find special for whatever reason. I don't have to have any religious significance to it. You know, I mean, I, I would love to go celebrate Diwali. I mean, I'm completely open to enjoying anybody's damn holiday according to their tradition. I, I, um, I've actually, uh, when I taught language arts, I taught the Christmas Carol and I had Jewish students. So there is an element of still of the religious part of, of Christmas. They're like, well, we don't celebrate Christmas. You know, and you know, and if I was another teacher, and I could be a butt munch about it, you know, and say, "Hey, this this country is founded on God. Why don't you celebrate Christmas?" You know, or something like that. And some 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 teachers do do that to to children. But yeah. I was just teaching it because I was teaching Dickens. But it it wasn't a a religious thing. Let's take our second caller, and Oliver, if I could, uh, Olivia, I'm sorry, if I can invite you, please um, mute your mic when you're not talking. We can hear your keyboard clicking away in a very irritating manner. Uh, but sorry, that's okay. Listen to how rude DPR is to our guests. I mean, I, I've I tried being British rude to you; it doesn't work. I'm trying being rude to the guests. I don't know, uh, for some reason. Maybe it's because I'm hosting the call when someone's typing on the keyboard. It comes through in my ear like a really loud click. Maybe you don't hear it. I know, but anyway. I hear it. I'm just let's, much more tolerant than you. Well, are. I'm intolerant because I'm older and I'm English. <laughs> At my age, I'm allowed to be intolerant. Anyway, on that bombshell, let's invite Olivia uh, to the show. What have you got for us today? Hi. Uh, sorry about the keyboard. No, do, I apologize for being cantankerous old English <laughs> git. That's okay. I love your videos, by the way. You're, you're great. Just browsing in the beginning. Um, well, I was Don't let me stop tonight. brown nosing, I love it. Um, what I was going to talk about is that I was like, my dad is like um, religious. He's not like Christian, but he's sort of with a mismatch of um, like deistic beliefs. He also believes in reincarnation. And obviously, I'm sort of an atheist. Um, and so we're discussing like the origin of the universe and God. And he sort of maintains that he, you know, he believes in evolution and all that stuff, but he believes that. You know, some instances, divine spirit or God created everything in the beginning. And like, well, if you can say, like, you know, when the big, what happened before the Big Bang, then I'll never bother you about this again. Um, and then, but I was saying, like, well, you, you know, by the same token, how can you say, like, how can you say where God came from? Like, how can you say like, that, you know, he was, he, then he responded with, God has always been there, he's eternal. I didn't really know what to say to that, like. What can I say? No, he isn't. So, there's one. Do you guys know what a good response to that would be? How oh, there's a there's a nova. Complex, uh, there's a nova complex. where Carl Sagan answers that exact question mm -hmm. in that exact phrasing. I'm sorry, what, uh, Cosmos, 
where, where Carl Sagan answers it so beautifully. And the punchline is, why don't we just save a step? If we could have a, an eternal universe, or if the mystery of God's eternalness is a mystery, why don't we just save a step and say that it, the whole thing is a mystery? Where, where eternity comes from, what the first thing was, what was the primal atom, all of those things. Why invent something with a name and a, an attitude and a, you know, give it personification? Why not just say, we don't know? It's a good question. How could something that complex always be here and not come from something else? Everything we've seen in the universe starts out in a simpler form and, and, it, and, it, and evolves. And those things need conditions to evolve. So, what, so that means the universe would have to be there for God to be there. So uh, it, it, how could something that, you know, more complex than anything we've ever known come from nothing? Well, again, you'll see my wife is talking about the same thing Concordance was talking about. She understands about emergent properties, and people who believe in God typically do not understand this. Yeah, I guess that was sort of what I want to say as well. well but what, then, uh, how, sorry. I'm sorry, for some reason your audio for me was obviously not as good as it was for the others because I didn't fully uh, hear what you're saying, but you're talking about your child? No, my dad. Oh, your dad. Um, well, yeah. it, it doesn't matter, in fact. It, um, the, the same point would apply. Um, my approach, which I've tended to adopt more recently, um, before even entering into any sort of discussion, is to get them to define exactly what they mean. And I think that that's the best way of getting them to think. What exactly is the nature of your God? Um, what uh, what is its form? What is its structure? What is its what is its capabilities, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can do that in a very non-hostile way. Uh, and I think that um, when you do adopt that sort of approach, it does cause them, force them uh, to start thinking. Uh, and that may be an approach to take. I don't know. Thunder, you've been quiet on this one. Do you have anything to say? I think Thunder left. Apparently not. He seems a, okay. We've lost Thunder. I thought he was still here. Mm. <laughs> asking asking questions is, I think, a good. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm here. You just you got me at the exact moment I was away from the keyboard. And Don't tell you. us why Thunder. There's no need for too much information. Okay. Um, no, I mean I I agree almost entirely uh, with what Concordance says. Yeah, um, if it's an unknown, you call it an unknown. Um, the only reason that you actually speculate about things or hypotheses, as we would actually call them in science, is if you actually plan to take it forwards. Um, if there is no no conceivable way that you can actually take it to um, a growth of knowledge, you're speculating about an unknown. You, know, you might as well be speculating about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It's just pointless hand-waving at an unknown. Um, yeah, I, 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 it, it, it does seem to be a an area that a lot of religious philosophers um, like to occupy. But I mean, ultimately, that's all it is: is it's hand waving at an unknown, and it's a particularly unproductive activity. When we went to Skepticon, there were some protesters standing outside, <laughs> and one of them was you know, carrying this giant, ridiculous wooden cross. And I had a bit of a confrontation with him where we were talking about the rules of debate. Uh, I said, well, it's a very simple thing. We, I'd be happy to, to debate you or your person. I just want to make this one rule that when um, – that I cannot say that something is unless I can show that it is. And if I can't show that it is, then the best that I can do is that I can say I can believe it for whatever reason. But if I can't show a reason, I really shouldn't even say that I believe it. I should kind of admit that it is an unknown. So – when you went in, I invited him to have the same rule. It's just let's be on the same same board here. So you cannot say that anything is unless you can show that it is. And I would not. That guy would not accept that rule. It's a simple enough thing. You know, I you, you can say that you've got somebody hiding in the closet, and 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 you refuse to go open the door because you want to believe there's somebody hiding in the closet, but you can't honestly make that statement. 
and I don't understand why people don't understand that it is dishonest to assert as fact that which is not evidently true, and that the whole position that religion is based on. Well, I appreciate the contribution made by Desert File in the chat. Always a pleasure to hear from you, Desert File. Um, actually, actually Protesters just... at a skeptic conference. What the fuck? Stop thinking critically. Stop thinking. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> No, no, no. I, 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 I think I got that beat. Did you say that these guys were carrying a cross? Yeah. Yeah, you should have got up to and asked them, are you, are you guys deity hunters? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, because we used a cross to get rid of the last one. Are you, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, these crosses are remarkably good for getting rid of, uh, uh desert, desert gods. Um, yeah, and speaking of, I mean, desert file, I want to, I want to throw out there that we also had protesters at the Reason rally, and yes, they were protesting Reason, quite literally. Um, there's one other thing that occurred to me when I was listening to the other caller, if you have time for another point. I know I didn't sure. um, This is sort of, it's sort of more related to science punk. I, um, I, uh, I've got to speak out quite a little bit to you, but I sort of live with someone who um, is not religious, as I can tell, um, but he doesn't accept evolution. He doesn't believe it's true. And I study biochemistry, so I know you know, a little bit about evolution, so I was trying to explain to him why it is true. You know, he started off with the whole, that if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys here? Which is at the point at which I knew. Hey, wait, wait. Can, I, can I jump in and say, if, if we did not come from monkeys, then why are we still monkeys? Can you throw that question at him? Could I, could I <laughs> yeah. ask another thing as well? Um, I think you said that he was not particularly religious, yet he doesn't believe in evolution. How does he think that everything happened? Yeah, that's why I couldn't get him. I, I asked him that, but he just got... Really okay, now, did, did you mention this one? Because this was this is a very good argument for the people that do the why are there still monkeys thing. I don't know how they imagined that all these individual monkeys would, by some catalyst unknown to science, all turn into people. And, and, and of course... If he's saying that, then he's he's only atheist because he hasn't found a religion yet. I've met people like this. They are uh, atheist uh, until they find a religion, and then they just claim that that one's the one that they believe. It's like shopping for these people. So yeah, what you've got is an actual theist in, in, in concealment. Ask him this. We know, for example, that dogs, domestic dogs, all domestic dogs were derived from Asiatic wolves. So... If dogs came from wolves, why are there still wolves? It is exactly the same principle. And I've had people argue that it is not, but it is. It's the identical same principle. And then once they realize that, then they realize the whole monkey thing. And then again, the question is legitimate. If we did not come from monkeys, then why are we still monkeys? And you're welcome to show him my video on that. There's another question you could ask him as well, if he does... Say, think that um, we came from mud and lightning, asking why there is still mud and lightning. Yeah, that's, that, that's one of the headshots. The other one is, um, uh, it, it works for Americans. You know, if, if Americans came from Europeans, why are there still Europeans? But again, it's one of those things I would suggest just ask him, because I think when you ask questions and get, well, obviously you have sought to do so, um, I, I think that's the most polite way of making them think and exposing the inadequacies of their answers if indeed they can in fact be called answers. Another... As I say, I just simply don't understand. If, if, if evolution is not the explanation, then he's going to have to come up with something pretty profound, which I imagine is going to have to involve some sort of magic. I, I, yeah. I simply don't see any other option that he has. Now, if he prefers to believe in magic than reality and science, then what can you do? I don't know. Yeah, I, another I good illustration. On it. I, I think people really want science to be intuitive. They want it to line up with their personal experiences. I mean, they're okay. 
okay with like quantum physics and these little particles they've never seen before doing whatever the scientists tell them happen. But when it comes to animals, people feel like they have a pretty good grip on, on animals. They understand how one animal makes a different animal. You know, they, a dog always gives birth to a dog. And when the scientist says to them, no, 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 the dog, you know, comes from a non-dog. Uh, ultimately way back down the line, people reject that. And they reject that because it's outside their own experience. Okay, I have to pause you. There are a couple of because... wonderful examples that people have been putting in the chat. D. Landon Cole to start with. It says, if cheese comes from milk, why, are, why is there still milk? Um, <laughs> so, the desert okay, pile, let me, let me give you something why are there still really cows? Help. And then someone, one last one said, Protestants came from Catholics. So, uh, yeah. Very good. We've got okay. a very we've got a very good audience today. Thank Olivia, you. Olivia, I want to give an explanation that will help help ease this because the problem that people have is they do not see evolution happening on populations, and two ways that you can show that. When we're talking about dogs, for example, don't talk about dogs. Talk about a subset of dogs. Talk about something like dachshunds, for example. I mean, we know we know we didn't have a amorphous mass of meat that suddenly turned into a dachshund. We know we know how the dachshund breed was bred, and it wasn't that you know basset hounds suddenly gave birth to a to a dachshund puppy. People can understand that small scale of how these new you know these new phenotypes emerge. The and problem with just that, back Aaron, up, if I may. And, and please deal with this, is that what they will say is happening there is microevolution and no, not even any creationist I'm aware of will say that microevolution doesn't happen. What they will say is you cannot go from dog types, kinds, to cat type things. So right, and, and again, that's a deliberate that. distortion. And the way to work around that is to look at languages. Because, you know, the Pat Robertson thing, or not, not Pat Robertson, but Ray Comfort, where he talks about that first dog poofing out of nowhere and then having to look for a female. Well, we know about the Latin-based languages, right? You know, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Romanian. Th these all came from Latin, right? And it's not that, you know, if, if, if French is a Latin-based language and comes from Latin, then why were there people that were speaking Latin when you suddenly have people speaking French? I can't say why is there still Latin, because there isn't still Latin in this case. But we didn't have suddenly one guy is speaking French, and he has to go find a woman he can speak French to, you know, and he's going to go find somebody who coincidentally suddenly starts speaking French. It's on a population scale. When you look at Spanish, for example, there's got all these archive stories like Don Quixote and all that. When you go back down through the ages, you start seeing Spanish, becoming closer and closer and closer to Latin. And you can see the divisions. You can do the same thing in the fossil record. But you have to look at it on a population scale. And language is a good way to illustrate that. So the macroevolution is the division between Spanish, French, and Romanian. These are complete different distinctions. This is macroevolution. None of them are Latin. And they're not able to intermingle. I mean, you can't have somebody who speaks Spanish understand what somebody who's speaking Romanian is trying to say. It doesn't work that way. Or I Italian. And I have to get, I have to apologize to Concordance, who uh, again, people in the chat will not be aware of, but has messaged me saying, "For God's sake, let me answer the question." I will, but I want to throw in before I come back to you, Concordance, two of the comments that have been made in the chat. Firstly. Um, from D. Landon Cole again uh, to uh, you, Concordance. If birds evolved from dinosaurs, why does Concordance have that avatar? Um, and there was a second one which I'll come back to you on. So please, in giving your answer, address that question as well. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to. I, what I recommend is The Relativity of Wrong by Isaac Asimov. If you haven't read it, if you don't understand what he's trying to, to say, it's, it's a very profound point in communicating science to lay people. And that is that the processes which are hardest to observe, but that are all around us, are the ones that no one will believe until the evidence is so profoundly overwhelming they can no longer deny it. The reason why very intelligent people, as recently as 2,000 years ago, had no idea that the Earth was round is because the curvature of the Earth is very near to zero. It is very hard to see that the Earth is in fact a giant sphere-like object, even though we're here all the time observing it. And if you had tried to assert to someone that the Earth is essentially round, 
before all of this evidence came out, until we had these photographs of the Earth. And of course, there are still people that don't believe that. But it's the fact that we are familiar with these objects and the rate of change that we are talking about, the departure from zero, the departure from what seems intuitive, is so very, very small that people require a great deal more persuasion to finally realize the truth of it. And that's the case of realizing the Earth is round. It's the case of realizing that plants and animals are constantly changing. They're just changing at such a rate that it is almost zero. And I understand why people, even non-religious people, have a hard time of accepting things like geological time, processes that happen on these profoundly long scales of time or on these profoundly huge scales of distance or these profoundly small scales of distance. It's very hard to accept them because they are so far from that narrow middle range that we are so accustomed to in time and distance and weight and force. That's it. That's all I'd say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Olivia, back to you. Yeah, that, that was really interesting. I think that is pretty much the, like, the crux of the matter I mean, for most people, and it's getting coded. One thing I was going to ask people is um, the whole macro micro evolution thing, like, is that a real thing in biology? Because, or is yes, it just it, it is, and I'll, I'll explain it very briefly. Because um, I never heard those terms, like, well, we did an evolution module last year, and they never mentioned. Yeah, uh, yeah, the microevolution and macroevolution were devised by evolutionary scientists, but they don't continue to use these words because they don't have any significant meaning in most instances. I mean, what it basically comes down to is that microevolution is all the variation that you would have within a given species, and that once speciation occurs, that is an example of macroevolution, and macroevolution would be then the uh, the degree of evolution that these populations would take between species, which is much as which is actually much accelerated because they're no longer restricted by the the parent gene pool. So, if if you have ever seen a new species emerge, and we've seen dozens, then you have seen macro evolution occur. It does occur in a lab. It does occur in direct observation. It's the micro macro thing are as far as um, as far as processes go, they're virtually identical. I mean, there are some population variants that other people will argue that are really into this sort of thing. But, and I've seen a couple of people that are really heavy into evolutionary biology say that there is a difference with these on the scale of populations that they're talking about once you segregate the original gene pool that was restricting the, the population at the time. But for your purposes, our purposes, there is no difference. It is the same thing. It's just change within a species versus change between species or speciation. And I hope that made sense. Yeah, yeah, that made complete sense, yeah. I reckon it... What I, what I find interesting, before you leave this, Olivia, I just want to pick up um, on, on that, because obviously that, um, the way you've described it is kind of like the way that the creationists would describe it, is it not? They're just saying that macro doesn't actually happen, it's only micro. I don't know whether we've lost Aaron. No, I'm here. I didn't, okay. I didn't hear what you said, I guess. Well, maybe you didn't miss much. The, the, the distinction that you described is not that different to that which the creationists rely on. Or the right. That's, I mean, that's where the, they can't get it from. Is, is It is true that uh, evolution within a species, that the change of uh, different things within a group is still called microevolution, and, and that is distinguished from macroevolution, where the, the competition is different. You know, you may have a, a pathogen and its host would both be undergoing macroevolution with respect to each other, whereas the microevolution would be the evolution of new groups within a single species. One, right? way, of, one you, way of addressing this is like when you look at uh, what is considered a subspecies if it's done by natural selection and a breed if it's done by artificial selection is that you will have a strain 
of a given uh, set of dog or cattle or whatever it is that we want to breed, that you have created unique traits that are identifiable as, to say, like when I mentioned before about dachshunds, you have what you could recognize as a dachshund. You have a stable breed. It's still chemically and physically interfertile with other breeds, but you have created a stable strain of your own breed. And natural selection does something very similar. Now, when these are separated to the point where a physical or chemical or even a social uh, boundary emerges where uh, these, these two groups, these two populations will not interbreed, sometimes won't even interbreed even, with the, even when they physically or genetically can, then you have an emergence of a new species. And that population is not restrained by the parent gene pool that it came from. It's no longer interbreeding with them. So it, it is able to diverge at a much faster rate now. Does that make any sense? Can I make a quick point on this too? If you punch the words into the literature, into the Medline database, if you punch in evolution, you get 330,000 papers returned. If you punch in macroevolution, you get 270. And if you punch in microevolution, you get about 500, 486. So we're talking about most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, when scientists refer to evolution in the medical literature and the scientific literature, they simply say evolution. There are a few cases where they have to differentiate the two processes simply because of some aspect of the population structure. But 99.9% .9 of the time, scientists simply say evolution um, because the the, the the laws governing that process apply to both within species and between species changes. Now, what the creationists want to happen when they talk about macroevolution is, again, another deliberate misrepresentation. They want macroevolution to be where a new species of fruit fly, for example, which we've seen many times, they complain it's still a fruit fly, or a new species of stickleback is still a stickleback fish. Well, of course, it's going to be taxonomically, it has to be the laws of evolution won't allow it to be anything else. But this is what they want to misrepresent. They want the parents to give birth to an offspring that is not related to its own parents. They want a stickleback fish to give birth to a banana tree. Which is why we end up with things like the crocodile. But this is, I mean, I, I don't want to go to that extreme because um, to me that shows such a degree of ignorance that uh, if, that hap if that happened, it would completely disprove the theory of evolution. Um, yeah. But I, w I do want to go to Thunderfoot on this because in what I consider is a um, ridiculously criticized uh, interview he had with Ray Comfort. The one thing that Thunderfoot did, if nothing else, was to actually get Ray Comfort to appreciate that speciation did take place. And he was referring uh, to the salamanders, I think, around the Californian basin. I can't remember. Yes, Thunderfoot, and you remember? Salamanders. Tell, tell us through that, because I, I know at the end his line was, oh, well, yeah, they were just infertile. Tell, uh, talk us briefly through the conversation you had with him. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it's basically... Um, the, the the gene flow uh, uh, is a function of environment. So there are these salamanders um, in the Sierra Nevada, which is a there are two ranges of mountains that go through California. One is the coastal range, and then there's a dry valley called the Sacramento Valley, and on the other side there's the Sierra Nevada, um, and there are these salamanders and. Uh, the the coastal range is wetter than the Sierra Nevada range, um, and so there's a, it's a fork species um, uh, that these salamanders have adapted to the coastal range or to the Sierra Nevada, and the they they can um, bridge the gap between the two mountain ranges further north where it's wetter. Um, and so each species is, or each um, population of salamanders in, can interbreed with the next, of course, until you get around to um, the ones that are separated by the dry Sacramento Valley, and they can't interbreed with each other. There is no, uh, um, well, they, they, they can't interbreed because they can't cross the geographical boundary, 
And even if they could, they can't interbreed because the genetics of the population is sufficiently um, different um, on both sides of the mountains. Um, and you ask this, uh, you put this to Ray, and you know he would agree that they're all the same species. And then you get to, well, what about the ones on both ends of the mountains? They can't interbreed. And he says, well, they're just infertile. And of course, that's not true. They are fertile. They can interbreed with the um, with the salamanders of the the same mountain range. They just can't interbreed with those on the separate mountain range. And, uh, and that's, at that, that point, that's the, yeah. That's and at the, that point, he had to agree that this was speciation. And you yeah, then and asked he him, agreed what's with the difference that? between speciation and you know? Uh, macro evolution and he, he basically didn't have an answer so far as I recall yeah um, he, the, the stunning answer was well if that's what you call evolution then I accept evolution or something along those lines uh, which is a bit of an irony because after that um, I think he went and did the interview with Pat Robertson where he suggested that evolution had to be wrong because if a dog evolves, um, uh, you know, with eyes, ears, um, lungs, whatever, um, unless the, there is a female dog that evolves at the same time, then you know, this dog that has evolved eyes, ears, whatever, will just die, which is um, so crazily dumb that it, it's difficult to know where to begin in that Dogs usually are products of reproduction, which requires both a male and a female of the species. Anyway. Which is a bit like the first man to speak French. That must have been awfully confusing, because when he started speaking French, no one else could understand what he was saying, right? Exactly. Far more succinctly put, thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, uh, it's actually a, uh, a very good analogy. Uh, I think the the uh, evolution of language, but um, I know that, and I can't remember who was um, speaking at the time. But I know that Aaron, uh, in the course of a conversation with someone, uh, did say that he would like to have had more time to talk about the evolution. Of, oh, I think it was when a video response to Taxi Andy some years ago. Uh, I, I think you should do a video or a couple of videos if you haven't already, Aaron, uh, about the evolution of the sexes because I think that. Um, that's something that a lot of people probably don't understand, myself included. I wanted to answer Olivia's question. I'm kind of used to simplifying science because I've taught it to children. Microevolution would be species level, um, like adaptation, stuff like that. And macroevolution would be population level well, no. changes. They're, they're both populations, though. Oh, like? Like a, a, a dachshund, for example. That's That's... A population. Now you can have other breeds in that, and they're they're all in the same population if they're intergenet if they're, you know, genetically intermingling. But you're not going to maintain separate breeds if you have them all mingling. So they're separate. They're kept as separate populations by breeders. So it's just the dachshund is not its own species yet because it's still capable of of breeding with others and will. Okay, and so it's not a separate species. When it gets to the point where it it can't or won't then it becomes a distinct species. So would macroevolution be community level? Like all the populations in a certain um, habitat? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's simply when you have this, this division that has its unique traits where every member of this population has these traits that are not shared in common with any member of the opposing population. And then the additional step, that's the, up to that point, is subspecies or breed. But then the additional step is when it either can't or won't interbreed with the other population and then they're completely separate. So the dominant gene pool usually imposes restrictions on diversity rather than encouraging that. And, and what you get with evolution is evolution ha happens faster in small populations divided from the whole. And so once they do that separation where the, where the parent gene pool has no more bearing or effect on them, they are free to diverge much faster. I think you summarized it beautifully, Lalandra. I think it is just basically any evolution above the species level is macro. Yeah, but it has to include species level. You know, the, yeah. the, the kind of amazing um, evolution they're looking for, like 
Like, why why were the, all these dinosaurs there hundreds of millions of years, and now the the world's dominated by uh, mammals? Um, that that is kind of like that. That's another level of understanding. Like um, that something like catastrophic has to happen to drive that kind of change, um, and uh, wipe out what it, it's like. It's called punctuated equilibrium. You go through these periods of stas uh, stasis where 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 um, the species don't change very very much, but then but then if something catastrophic like climate change happens and and uh, lots of uh, forms become extinct, that opens up niches for for another type of uh, animal to come in and 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 uh, and change and and really like that's that's where things like like um, evolving from the the ocean to the land happened. There was rapid evolution there. Because there, there was all these available uh, jobs for these uh, different types of uh, of uh, animals to do. Um, so. Yeah, I guess like that's sorry. Go ahead. Okay. No, Olivia, I Olivia, think one of the one of the most fundamental concepts is cladogenesis versus anagenesis. Right, cladogenesis is where new species evolve by breaking off of existing ones. Right, you get isolation of one population, it becomes a new species over time. Right, cladogenesis is what 95% of what happens in the in the in nature. Anagenesis, A N A genesis, is where an entire population sort of spontaneously changes to something else. It does happen. Right, you you have especially in viruses, uh, anagenesis is still very much uh, a case where the next generation is completely different from the previous generation. Usually because we have this massive die-off. Right, anagenesis does occur, and that's the kind of changes that they focus on. You know, dogs and wolves look very different from each other. That's a cladogenesis event, meaning that one split off of the other and we quote unquote still have wolves, right? In anagenesis, that is a question to be asked, right? If uh, a new subtype is dominating uh, someone with uh, HIV infection, right? They may develop some new subtype that is resistant to drugs or that evades the immune system response. In that case, we do actually often have anagenesis, where generation two looks very different from generation one without any of generation one surviving to become part of generation two. So that's their concept of evolution. And it's not out of the question, but it's very uncommon uh, among what we might call larger animals. Another thing that they focus on, which is again, which is possible, but again, very rare, is hybridization. You can get a new species by hybridizing two existing species. And that's what creationists typically think of as the evolutionary example. They, they're always talking about you take a lion and you take a tiger and you get a new species out of it by mi mi mixing them together. But that's not evolution. I mean, hybridization can produce new species, but it's an extremely rare process. Cladogenesis dominates everything. And cladogenesis is the thing I can't get them to understand, except when I use the example of different breeds of dogs. Only then can they get the concept of how that works. And then they want to create some imaginary boundary where you can't get you know the whole of all the different dog breeds coming from the whole of all the different wolf breeds or wolf subspecies, if you will. And they want to think that there's some boundary in that, but there's not. It's exactly the same process. Yeah, that was pretty much like my understanding of it as well. Just in course, when you mentioned like anagenic, um, evolution is that sort of with things like antigen shift and antigen drift being involved in that? Is that is that not the same? Yeah, we we tend not to think of it because that's within a single organism, right? So it's it's not classical biological evolution. It's biological change, but it's not a change in the genotype of the organisms involved. Their DNA fundamentally doesn't change. Oh wait, 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 wait! Well, you're talking about antigenic shifts in the in the the virus population or the pathogen. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Totally. Uh, that's usually an antigenic change. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. This has been like really helpful to me. I mean, no, that's that's applied because of extreme selective pressure that wipes out the entire collective except for a a favored subset. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. It's usually the result of some catastrophic change that simply eliminates. You know, the fitness uh, advantage is so massive.
Now, can that also be, because um, I believe that you've, you've got something similar going on with australopiths and uh, early homoenes because all the australopiths died out, there's nothing left to survive them, and it was a very brief period of transition between you get between australopiths and homoenes. But the thing is that, that the, this, the reason why came after they split. Split, I think, right? The the reason this fitness uh, difference between the parent and the child generation or, or subspecies, um, that event, that cladogenesis occurred, and then one of the lines died off. That's not quite anagenesis, which is, you know, 99% of a population dies off, and what of what remains, um, we have one extreme example, um, and what what triggered that thought is punctuated equilibrium. Uh, is quite often to produce an anagenic event where we have, let's say, 99% of the population dies off. You don't get a new species. The species essentially remains the same, but it looks completely different because we killed off 99% of the population. We're left with, let's say, we have red and blue winged butterflies, and you, the only ones to survive had, you know, double blue wings. Then that species now has double blue wings, and that defines the same species. But post anagenic event, it has a completely different phenotype. Silence. I think on the basis that we may have lost Aaron. No. Um, oh, no, we're still here. Uh, yeah, do you want to come back? Video. Blue is mine. As, as ever, we've got one last caller that wants to be squeezed in. So, uh, a brief response, Aaron. No, I, I was looking for a, a description of anagenesis that would make sense in human. Um, human phylogeny because it looked to me like what you had was uh, several things that the concordance had actually shown me on these defective genes that actually make us we have all these uh, uh, ancestral primate genes that have gone defective and that's actually the things that make us the way that we are that, that enable our brain to uh, to enlarge the way that it did for example was a uh, collection of different defective genes on the amount of musculature that we have in our jaws and indeed on our musculature as a as a whole we have about half the muscle mass of the other great apes so if the australopiths were in this category where they have half muscle mass as we do then you would have a substantial selective pressure against those the ones that will cohabitate and be and be mutually supportive of each other as we were versus all the others and so we I don't see that as a cladogenesis so much because it does seem like it was a shift from the australopiths into the homoenes with nothing left and that it was an isolated population that whole time and you are mm -hmm. correct, Oren. I'm looking at a paper here in 2006, Journal of Human Evolution. Uh, Australopithecus amanensis, ancestral to A. afarensis, a case of anagenesis in the hominin fossil record. So you're right. Gordon, so I'm going to, I'm going to I'm stop wrong. this self-congratulatory uh, uh, process at the moment, partly because I suspect we're losing not only the host of the show, uh, but also some of the audience. It's a very detailed uh, area, which I don't think we have time to go into. Uh, and also, as I say, we have got one, one last caller to uh, introduce. Olivia, thank you very much indeed for the call. If we want to expand on that, if you want to expand on that, please uh, call in on a future show. Uh, I'd be glad to, uh, we'd be glad to have you on again. Thank you Thanks very much indeed. Guys. Take care. Uh, we're going to introduce very quickly last caller, because as ever, we are running out of time. In fact, we've overrun, but uh, they always come in at, at, towards the end. I'm sorry, I didn't mean any disrespect to the conversation, but... Um, it seemed to be going down to, uh, to a level of detail that uh, I suspect a lot of people were going to get lost on. So let's bring it back down to basics with uh, Sky's the Limit. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Aaron, it's great Hi. to see you back. Absolutely, we missed you all. And, uh, <laughs> and good evening to your beautiful lady wife. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you even online. To get to the point, uh, I don't want to... Um, uh, just going back, if I might, DPR, to that earlier thing about the Mayan thing and the predictions and all the rest of it. Um, I, I, I'll just put it out as a brief statement, but also as a question, really and truly. Um, um, you, you, you guys discussed it earlier, and all the stuff that was out online about this, um, you know, end of the world stuff and whatever, um, you know, it's just that, and, and there's all kind of bullshit on, on the internet, like, 
you know, spooking people about, you know, the sun would do this and, and, and its solar flares, which it does every 11 years anyway, about the magnetic uh, you know, polar reversal, which, which happens anyway, and it, it, or even to the earth spinning back. And I just think that if, for example, if you think of Christianity, Europe and the Americas is based largely, of course, on a Christian Judaic tradition, which is, of course, an apocalyptic death cult um, religion, if you will. So I'm not surprised. My question to the scientists out there, all three of you or more, <laughs> is that do you think, because NASA got so many emails on this, on the scientific questions about, I mean, again, the, uh, the Earth's um, magnetic um, field turning around, the Earth spinning the opposite direction, just because there's an, a, um, a solar flare every 11 Look, years. Adam, well, how is the Earth it? meant to start spinning backwards? I know, <laughs> Thunder, but that's, that's the kind of stuff that was spread out there. They thought because the reversal of the Earth's magnetic field, the, the Earth would actually start spinning in the opposite direction. No, 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 no. It means that the Earth will turn upside down. <laughs> I found as long as that. <laughs> My question is, no, seriously, do you think that it was a bona fide thing to do or a clever thing to do? Because I'm, I, it, it's simply because, I guess, of lobbying. NASA got so many messages. Do you think it gave any credence to this? Or should NASA have actually answered? And they have put out statements on this. Do you think they should have interve intervened or not? Right, I believe it's for teaching science. Yes. I know, yeah. but they did. But they did put out statement, guys. They did because they just, you know, I don't know, was alarmist. Twenty-two percent of it alone, of all the volume of mail they got, was in the United States. Um, do, do you think they should have even like gone there at all? Because it gives, it lends a credence of kind of because it's NASA. Should I? I mean, I don't have to qualify. It's pure science. Do you think they should have even addressed it at all? It's just like urban mythology. In Carl Sagan's Cosmos, when Sagan went on about the uh, the astrology charts that were written in the newspaper, I was wondering, why is he going here? Why does anybody actually need to hear this? And he was addressing a significant population that actually believes this stuff. I didn't appreciate that at the time. So I'm not, I don't have any intimate uh, knowledge of what you're talking about here, but if, if, if uh, NASA is addressing a, a substantial population of people that believe in nonsense woo and they're clarifying that position, yes, I believe in doing that, yes. But, but they did, Aaron. They really did. They actually, I, I'm not saying official press statements, but they did. It, it, they were overwhelmed. Um, this was building up for like since 2008. And they, 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 I, I don't know, I don't know their uh, public relations department, but they felt they had to respond to some of this stuff. It was so alarmist, you know. I have seen a, a lot of times science will, uh, will not do itself any favors when they don't pay attention to the nutters, when the nutters have a substantial voting block. There, yeah. there gets to be a time when you have to address that mis that that misperception. Mm. Yeah, it's well, so I true because the the funding is tied to public support, uh, you know, via Congress and the departments or whatever. And in Europe, of course, there's European Science Councils, but all of that is tied to the public's perception of what goals science is pursuing. And I think that if NASA can put itself, there is no bad press, as they say, mm. if they can put themselves in front of people saying, look, we have the answers here, or we have a pretty good sense of it, not only is it a good chance to talk about science, but it's a good chance to remind people that there's a big group of experts out there that we pay their salaries with our taxes. Mm. Um, and it's nice to have them there because they seem like they know what's going on, and maybe I don't have to uh, dig a, a, a bomb uh, shelter in my backyard and start stocking up on ammunition. I mean, these are real, <laughs> tangible answers that we can give. This is something Neil deGrasse Tyson is saying on Twitter, basically, that, mm. you know, I promise, I will tell you when the asteroid or the planet Nibiru or the giant sunspot are all headed for Earth, because we'll see it coming. You know, we have to spend the money on these science objectives because these are questions that need to be answered. They affect us in the real world. So, yeah, by all means, NASA, address the things that people actually care about. We're, we're ultimately in a customer-driven industry, right? We're producing knowledge that needs to be known. I, I disagree with a lot of scientists who feel that science should be for its own sake. I disagree. I think there needs to be a goal that people care about. Mm, absolutely. And uh, just on that concordance, and actually 
Well, actually, DPO, you said it earlier. I mean, when you said, I mean, there have been thousands of predictions. What do you think of my observation, Jeffs? I mean, that, as I said, the Judeo Christian tradition is, a, is fundamentally an apocalyptic prediction, the coming of the Messiah and all this of it. And it's yeah, a death. But don't, it's worry, a don't worry. You can, you can sit calm for a thousand years or so because when this topic came up with Howard Camping, 18 mm. months ago when he predicted the end of the world on May 21st, 2011. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, see a video by the uh, erudite and foresightful uh, YouTube user Van and Fang X and he assured me that the correct interpretation of the Bible meant that it was going to be 1,000 years plus another seven years for this or that uh, mm. before it could actually happen. So although we might be living in the days of the rapture, the actual rapture wouldn't happen for another millennia. So I, I think unless you're worried about your great 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 grandchildren, I think you can sit happy for now. But no, seriously, uh, I think it's of course it's an entire joke. Will it start happening? Apparently not. There seems to be uh, this mentality amongst uh, the religious, of whatever flavor, it doesn't seem to matter, um, that the end of the world is nigh uh, and it is something to be looked forward to and they, they um, welcome the fact that it's coming soon and what what worries me and would should worry anyone mm. of sound mind is what happens when these fundamentalists uh, gain possession of nuclear weapons and also believe that the end of the world is nigh and they can actually do something that they can to assist the acceleration to the end of world times yes that is deeply disturbing but what do you think motivates people DPR on that? I mean, why, why, why is this? Because I think they are sufficiently indoctrinated to believe that there is something called the afterlife in which the world would be better and it is their duty to accelerate the time when that end of the world actually happens. And but it, it, is, it is simply a matter of indi religious indoctrination. And don't tell me otherwise, because without religious indoctrination, they wouldn't believe in the end times. Mm, I agree with that. From my but own experience, I can add, that these people, a lot of times, they, they have a hatred for the life that they live, and the bodies that they have, and the, the world that they're in. They find the real world as it is to be disgusting and intolerable, and they want a different one. And they're w wholly willing to destroy this one to get it. It, it seems to be that. I mean, I, I, I'm conflicted on it myself, Aaron. I, I just think it's like... Uh, you know, it's like, is, is it uh, the, the thing of, um, you know, the adrenaline rush when you pass an accident? You know, it's the human thing. Or is, is it like that we are so singular, it's that reductionist thing, it's very diminutive, that we, we find our own existence incomprehensible. And so it's like we're, we, we live through a kind of a guilt stage that we don't, like, it's too much, it's too lovely, it's too beautiful, it can't be real. I, I must be paying a price for this, there's a payoff somewhere, it's all going to end, or it's like... I really don't know. And I've let let me throw one example into the melting pot and see what you think about this. I remember, and I know that Aaron has seen this because he's um, referred to it before, um, on either May the 21st in Times Square or it was on uh, Camping's second prediction, which I think was October the 22nd, I can't remember. Hmm. People gathered in Times Square, um, the majority being those that just knew it was not going to happen. But there were one or two camping supporters, and one in particular was filmed, and he's there, literally waiting, counting the seconds down. Yeah. And as the seconds go past the six o'clock hour, <laughs> there's this sort of look of complete confusion on his face. There's no, angst, there's no animosity, there's, it's, it's just simple confusion. So he's... when you say these people are driven by a desire for the end of times, I'm not so sure. I just genuinely think that this person was sufficiently mentally um, disturbed that he mm. thought it was going to happen and he couldn't understand why it didn't happen. Mm. And he sold everything that he owned. <laughs> I know, that, yeah. is that the, that's the guy who paid $100,000 I think for billboards or something like that, was it? Yeah, I think it was it's about 140000 It was his entire <laughs> pension fund he sold for Harold Camping. It's, and what happens kind of... afterwards? He's left homeless and moneyless and Harold Camping still in his nice house with another $140,000 <laughs> refusing to answer the door because he can't deal with the question why didn't it happen yeah it's kind of funny too how how these people use and discard science they'll 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 listen to nasa when they think that 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 some solar maximum is going to destroy um a solar storm is going to destroy the earth exactly on december 20th you know and mm. it, 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 they or they'll 
like I was trying to explain it to my class, they were wanting to know if the world was going to end. And they're listening to me when I say, yes, there are solar storms and the sun is at a solar maximum or whatever. Wow. But then but then they tune me out when I when I say, uh, when they, they ask me point blunt, I go, they ask me, is is the world going to end on, on, on December 20th? I go, well, mm -hmm. uh, in science, you can only say something possibly could happen, mm -hmm. but it's well, not very likely. But I'd have to go back to Aaron as well. Sorry, I, thought, I want to go back to Aaron very quickly. I'm going to try and wrap things up fairly soon. But I know, Aaron, that you have also commented on this as a way of people avoiding personal responsibility. Mm. Yeah. Jog our memories. Tell us what your views are. No, 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 no. I, I, uh, I, 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 I got to leave it. Well, okay. I'm not well, if, I'm, if, if, I, if, I, if I might then, I just wrap up very, very briefly, DPR, um, to respond to what uh, Concordan said. You're absolutely right, Concordance. What NASA actually did in the end, because as you all know, we have, um, uh, you know, tragedy and emergency services sort of standing by kind of survival stuff in order anyway. So for those who kind of didn't believe their scientific explanations, like don't panic, nothing's going to happen. They said, refer to your local state, whatever, because we do have um, tsunamis and storms and earthquakes and we do have stuff in place. So that means, you know, it it's stop, stop. Katrina, did it? Yeah, exactly. Well, stock up, stock up with baked beans and fresh water and or and batteries, batteries and water, but obviously not at the same time. <laughs> what I found <laughs> interesting was that the people who were giving out that advice were quite often um, the theists as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't want to mention since, since Use Katrina practical was steps. brought up. Since Katrina <laughs> was brought up, I want to mention that Katrina was a horrible disaster because it happened in New Orleans, and New Orleans did not respect science. They certainly didn't pay any attention to climate change science. We had heard years earlier uh, you know, on a documentary talking about the climate and all of this that was saying that the next time that there was a category four or greater hurricane that would directly hit New Orleans, that it was going to sink. Mm. So when they brought up the news and they said there's a category four and it's headed straight for New Orleans, I brought my son into the room and I told him that news and he says, it's going to sink. He remembers. He remembers the news story. We knew that it was going to happen. We knew in advance that it was mm. going to happen. And he had all these people that refused to leave, that refused to do anything about it. And that's why it was a huge tragedy. It was one of the reasons why. That's but when, when you had this mega storm hit, the, hit the, the, the eastern seaboard more recently, they would learned the lesson from Katrina. And also, we're talking about New York now. They are much more inclined to accept what the science says. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't, even though it was a, a storm of, of considerably greater magnitude, I think, um, it was better prepared for and they were better, better able to deal with it. So it wasn't quite the loss of human life and tragedy that Katrina was. Thank oh, goodness. Bombshell, Sky. I, 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 on. No, I, I, you, you had your last moment. Steve, once no, thank you, very, thank much. you very much indeed for the call. <laughs> uh, I am going to move on because it's 20 minutes after we normally finish, and there are a couple of announcements I have to make before we go through the panel. Uh, just in relation to future shows, the next one, two weeks' time, we hope to have Seth Andrews, the moving force behind Thinking Atheist, on the show as our special guest. The week after that, which will be the 30th of December, we're hoping to have a Christmas special in which we are seeking to invite back some of the guests that we have had on over the course of the year, which, if you are not familiar with, oh, Lordy, where do we start? Dr. Andy Thompson, um, David uh, Silverman, um, Justin Griffiths, Richard Dawkins, Sean Fairclough, uh, Lona Frank, um, oh, the, there's more. Uh, we're going to, oh, non stamp collector. Uh, he's actually the first one who has agreed in principle to appear on our Christmas special. Uh, as uh, another one, Potholder54, we'll see if we can get him back. So um, that's something to look forward to. Uh, as ever, these uh, shows will be posted on YouTube within hopefully the next 24 hours. There will also be an MP3 file from which you can download from our website. And we now have, thanks to the Rationalizer from our Sister channel, The Gin and Tonic Show, which runs every two weeks on the Saturday, followed by us on the Sunday. Um, the Rationalizer has managed to sort out iTunes for us. I know I've got to update the website to tell you where to find it, but they are now on iTunes. I think the last ten shows or so are on iTunes. So, those are things to look forward to. Um, thank you to all those that have watched and called in, and to Tony behind the scenes for bringing us to us in all its glory. Final words from Concordance has disappeared. What's happened to 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, he said he had to drop off early. Um, final words then uh, from our, it's almost like a special guest who you've been away so long, Aaron. Aaron and Mrs. Aaron. <laughs> All right, I, um, uh, no, nothing special to report here. Always fun to do the show. I'm sorry I haven't been able to do it in so long. Um, thank you for having me on. I I thought maybe I could help out with Arn, you know, <laughs> in case he gets out of control, you know. <laughs> Arn getting out of control? Surely never. <laughs> I'm just, I'm joking about that. <laughs> she told me before the show she wanted to be here to jab, be able to jab me in the ribs to let me know when I'm talking over people. <laughs> oh, that's my job. Uh, thank you for <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you very much indeed. We will see you in two weeks' time, as I say, hopefully with uh, Seth Andrews, and then in four weeks' time for our Christmas, Christmas special. Uh, bring your Christmas hats and crackers and be uh, ready for some giggles. We will see you in two weeks' time. Thank you very much again, Tony. Uh, I think we'll end it there. Take care.